fellow. I really like his work. He's new. He still has the virginal afterbirth all over him from his initial initiation. He timidly came before us and said, more, more, no. Uh, thank you, Dickens. Uh, Sean Foley is a very interesting human being. He, like Lou O'Neill, another deep, 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 indelible witness. You can't be cynical with these folks who have seen the most nihilist side of insanity. But he has a brilliance and he's full of light and resilience and savoir faire and plum a plum. I really like him. Sean Foley. Thank you. Um, this is a kind of a love poem. Uh, I wrote it 32 years ago. Um, shortly after I got out of the Marine Corps and I was trying to put my life back together. And uh, it's ultimately a poem about distance. This is the first time I've ever read it in public, the whole thing. It's called Lovelace Dentistry. Dinner was over. Often it began like this, simply past dark. There was no television, no want of one. Often of habit, I ate tuna from the can. I would walk around afterwards with the fork in my mouth, tasting metal against my teeth. An only sink was small and shared in the bathroom at the far end of the wooden hall. My room mostly bare and clean. A desk, a small refrigerator, a dresser painted gray like a filing cabinet, books, an odd ink stain on the wooden floor near the door, a few clippings taped neatly to the walls, a small, small reading, reading lamp on by the bed, nothing more. I had come home from work. I had come home from the service. I had come back from St. Thomas and Providence and New York City. I had come back to the town I grew up in. I had one room above some real estate offices, an office on the main road through town, a road called something like East Middle Turnpike or Center Street, an old route, first with one number and then two. There was a new highway being built just outside of town, and its echoing slow mechanical noise traveled in. The excavations had gone on for years, mostly while I was away. Nearly finished now, there were new, yet to be opened, tiers of interchanges to the east and to the west and to the north. Strip mining equipment had removed seemingly heroic quantities of earth and rock. Six and a half million cubic yards moved. To include in a disappearance the whole area of a park where a bright, beautiful girl and I had once tried to make love by laying our school uniforms down in a field. If you could get close enough, 60 feet below what had been the rough green surface, outsized equipment was quietly lined in rows on bare red earth, waiting to be dismantled and taken away to the next job in some other state. Yet the town itself is still mostly physically unchanged, but wouldn't remain so long. I had gotten my old job back at the nursery where I had worked in high school. I had no plan of staying. I was saving to go away again. The smart kids I had known in school had finished college long ago. I had a bicycle I still loved. I didn't drink coffee yet. And even in my 20s, I never thought of beer. Most of the foremen at the nursery were athletes of a kind, trying to stay physically attached to some better self. I had been a Marine, the very last thing I would have ever thought in high school. The owner of the nursery called us grunts, so we called ourselves grunts. It was six, 10-hour days per week, 
irregardless of weather. This night was in early November, past the time change. There was five, maybe six weeks left in a nine-month nursery season. There was the effort of holding on. Some crews had dropped out already, exhausted. Others tired, anxious, yet full of wishful thinking that winter would come and would be easier. That particular fall was maybe especially rainy and cold, weather that even then went to my hands and bones. Sometimes I was so wet and cold, my teeth hurt. So we went to work in the dark and came home in the dark. The leaves had gone from the one maple between my room and the road. The offices were mostly empty. I would take off my boots and muddy clothes on a back porch and make my way through the desks and chairs and my underwear. Upstairs, before I could lay down to read, I would take a shower first and eat and look out the window at the traffic and at the buildings across the street. I have looked now for months before I understand the sign says, Dr. Lovelace. In a large picture window, a woman all in white has her fingers in someone's mouth. From my room above the real estate offices, I can see the bottoms of the patient's shoes and imagine his tonsils. She is above him. He is laying back at her waist with his eyes closed. She holds a silver mirror on a silver wand to a hole in his head. Her shoulders are bent in the universal posture of effort, bent to a wheel somewhere above his Adam's apple. The traffic in the street between us has long thinned past rush hour. Her light alone shines with industry. I am aware that this is late work, like any other thinking it must be an awful job to have someone else's saliva all over your hands all day, I wait for a long black trailer to move forward so I can look at her again to see if she's enjoying it at all. There, it is something familiar, close but divided by the many first and last military haircuts and a wandering of jobs that were nothing but a walk through a gate with a paycheck. There is the girl who took me to her senior prom who had wanted to be a hygienist. The girl I spent until four in the morning with my tongue in her ear, trying to hear whether I should put my hand into her pants, whose breasts I remember, if only because they were breasts. It rained the next day, so we couldn't go to the beach like you're supposed to after a prom, and I sat around with pictures of her older brother in the army politely marching between small kitchen and smaller living room, making fast friends with her mother and younger sisters. We went to the drive-in that night in her father's car, and the next day, Sunday, I helped him replace an old, cheap, above-ground swimming pool with one I am sure is equally old and rusted now. I remember her father sent me out in his car with the youngest son to get bigger washers at the lumber store. And when we got back, the kid told him I drove too fast. The old man just looked at me until I looked away and we finished the pool. It would be hours filling. Her mother offered, was very happy and offered me a pair of Joey's stationed in Hawaii trunks. I said no, that I had to go home to see if my parents were asking had I gone to church. For me, there would be another year of Catholic high school. I went home that night, after the night, after the prom, to call another girl. And after late mass, went out to her, this other girl, as if by appointment. I would fall in love with her so soon. Love in ways deeper than what I felt for my own parents. Neither of us could know yet what this would mean. Our love was difficult. When it was over, it was like they say, like pulling teeth. For a girl who did not believe in God, still she found a way to use words like always and forever. I was the cautious, unimaginative one. After a graduation, we ran away together. I came back without her. You knew that.
She was taller, braver, faster, and more beautiful. And what she could see, I could not know. I could not keep up, even as I tried mostly everything. Does it mean anything at all if I tell you this was at the end of the 70s in America, that her car had reclining bucket seats, a subcompact in which we would lie back together close, and for hours at a time, I found myself awkwardly stretched open and then wider, unknowingly in need of such help with time, I became her patient. Those evenings I entrusted to her care, some part of me to clean, I could not clean. True, there was pain there, but of course I could not see to know why. Neither one of us was any kind of real doctor. Yet, no one can deserve such care. I didn't. I was, for a short while, what is commonly diagnosed as lucky. To be in her chair, she would look closer and find just inside of me, in my mouth, all that was soft and at the beginning of decay. And she filled those places with her very mercury, a sweet metal tasting of warmth, almost liquid, at first bright and palpable, and only vaguely then, of silver. Hers was an amalgam for all I was, an identification still I carry within me, so to name me against some careful record long after what was once flesh is gone. Thank you.